Welcome to the FCA Leadership Forum Five Question Series. I'm Max Kakis with FCA International. Our guest today is Lieutenant General John Sattler, U.S. Marine Corps retired. Until his retirement in 2008, he was the Director of Strategic Plans, J-5, with the Joint Staff at the Pentagon. Prior to that, his service has included stints as Commanding General of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force and Director of Operations with the Joint Task Force in the Horn of Africa. Currently, he's a consultant and speaker and holds the leadership chair at the Naval Academy's Vice Admiral James Stockdale Ethical Leadership Center. General Sattler, welcome to ASEA. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, I'm honored to have the invitation, Max. I'm really excited to be here and meet some, uh, some great people and have a great conversation here. Very good. I'm looking forward to it also. Now, one of the highlights of your career includes the time you spent commanding Marines in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Horn of Africa. Uh, out of all of that experience, what would you say are the characteristics in an individual that mark a person as a good potential leader? Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> of course, I had some phenomenal leaders working under me as, uh, inside mm -hmm. the MEF to include the Sergeant Major, my right-hand man, uh, Sergeant Major Carlton Kent, and, and the Command Master Chief, the senior enlisted sailor leader for the whole crew, mm -hmm. uh, Command Master Chief Sanchez. Uh, we were actually nicknamed the three-legged milking stool because any time <laughs> we got in a helicopter, flew somewhere, or took a convoy to go out to visit units out in the field, mm -hmm. the three of us always arrived together. Then we sort of split up to, to go out and get a sensing for how the leaders, uh, the young leaders were doing, and in some cases, some of the older leaders, uh, to, uh, just to, to, to feel the pulse, uh, the attitude, the motivation of, of the uh, young men and women that were in, in combat. Uh, I would say the, uh, the traits that really stuck out, the young men and young women who were extremely successful uh, had a couple things going for them. Number one, they were very selfless. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be dead on their feet, tired as could be, hungry, but when the food came, uh, they ensured everybody, and, and it wasn't just pro forma, it was, it was in their ethos. Everybody else ate, and if there was anything left at the end when we had hot food, mm -hmm. uh, they would belly up last along with the senior enlisted leader. So that was the way the team went. When they, when they were thirsty and the Gatorade came or they had water that showed up, mm -hmm. the same approach. They walked around even though they may be parched, mm -hmm. but that selfless attitude of caring, sincerely caring for the men and women, uh, that always inspired and, and, and built trust uh, across the force. And the last one was uh, when it was time to go to bed at night when everybody was dog tired uh, after a full day, even in combat. Uh, the, the best leaders were the ones that ate last, drank last, and they slept last. Mm -hmm. And as uh, they used to always tell me, so there was only one time where a, a great leader is, uh, gets to be first. And I said, well, when was that? And they said, in the morning, get up and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. So that, that selfless attitude inspired men and women that they knew if it wasn't about you personally, and, and, and it never was for them, that, uh, that when you gave them a tough, onerous task to go into combat, to leave a safe place, to go down a road on a convoy where there may be IEDs or an enemy ambush, they knew when you told them to go that it was in the best interest of the organization, not mm -hmm. yours, that you had done everything in your power right. based on your selfless attitude to turn the odds in their favor. Now, let me ask you something, because it sounds to me like these people were, were your hand-picked team, the, these leaders that you just described by name. Were these people who came up through the ranks through the way that they presented themselves while they were in service, or were these the kind of people that you could kind of see something in them and then be able to draw that out and, and bring them to bring that to the fore? Actually, Max, they, they weren't handpicked uh, by me. Mm -hmm. I came in behind uh, Lieutenant General Jim Conway, who mm -hmm. went on to be the commandant. Right. I came in, I was, the, I was the only new guy. The whole organization, all the junior commanders were in place mm -hmm. when I came into Iraq okay. uh, before the Second Battle of Fallujah. So in this particular uh, case, you play the hand you're dealt, and that's the way the Marines do it. We never sure. bring a team in with us when we show up as a, as a new commander. Mm -hmm. But the great news is that, that that team was built from officer candidate school where they they inculcated that, that ethos, that spirit, mm -hmm. uh, all the way up through the basic school and through their junior commands as they came up. And, of course, working for uh, General Conway and General Rich Natonsky, uh, General Keith Stalter, and General Rich Kramlick all each had a segment of the sure. organization. They also are very selfless individuals, very, uh, very dedicated. So uh, I did not have the opportunity, nor did I have to pick and choose people. The, the system worked along that way. And I believe 
uh, at least my, my take, 37 years as a Marine, mm -hmm. and I think the other services do it too. We don't have the market cornered on leadership, sure. but the uh, the idea was you, you pick the you pick the, uh, the right lieutenants to be captains and company commanders. You pick the right company commanders to command the battalions and the right battalions to command the regiment. So there's a calling out along the way. Doesn't mean those who don't make it to the next tier are any less a Marine, but uh, as you just said, you're looking for those traits to go ahead and you don't, you, it's, it, it can be a learning experience, but not in combat. You right. gotta put your best folks mm -hmm. at the next level based on their proven performance here and their potential to the next level. Right, now you mentioned selflessness, for example, those Absolutely. examples of, le of your, uh, your leaders who uh, would put their men and women ahead of themselves. Absolutely. What would you say is another characteristic uh, that's important to have for a leader, and we all know leaders who, you know, who are the point of the spear when you're going out on on a run. Uh, but what, uh, what what would be another characteristic you, that you would say is important for leadership? The uh, uh, and I know Stephen Covey wrote a book called Speed of Trust. Mm -hmm. And if if you distill down through the book, it says trust. Uh, the one equation that I small equation that I liked is trust equals competence right. plus character. Mm -hmm. Competence plus character. So the best leaders are the ones, they're competent, they can call for a fire, they can control air coming in. Uh, if they're pilots, they can fly that aircraft better than anybody on the face of the earth. If they're naval officers, they know how to maneuver that ship. So the competence piece, I think based on the fact that you're a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, we all take that for granted, or coast mm -hmm. guardsmen. So if you've been promoted, we, we, we give you the benefit of the doubt to be competent, but we watch for your character. Uh, uh, some of the ones on the negative side, arrogance. Uh, you know, arrogance, excess, yeah. excess hubris mm -hmm. will turn an organization off. And that's the, that's the antithesis of the selfless sure. leader. Selfless, selfish. In the old days, and you and I both owned dictionaries when we grew up, we didn't <laughs> Google words, but if you could look up selfless and selfish in the dictionary, they're actually an inch apart. And I used to tell the young, young officers years ago when they had dictionaries that uh, leadership's a game of inches. Mm -hmm. But in that inch, you can be the, the, the best leader going, the selfless, the we, us, they. Aren't they phenomenal? You did a phenomenal job. And if you're looking to pass the credit, boss, pass it to them. Right. You know, the, and then that's the selfless, but the selfish. Mm -hmm. I, what have you done for me today kind of attitude? How, how, what have you done to make me look good? I just did a great job. Right. And boy, that, uh, that piece right there, that lack of humility, mm -hmm. excess hubris, mm -hmm. will, will, will erode trust fast. Faster, faster than anything. Uh, the, the humility piece, it's pretty hard to be selfless and not be uh, humble right. uh, because you're, you know, everyone before self is what selfless means. So the, the leaders who, who didn't walk around bragging, bragging, didn't run for the microphone or when the cameras came tried to get in front of them, mm -hmm. those are the leaders the men and women looked up to and they knew they could be trusted back to, uh, to Stephen Covey's uh, point. Of course, the, uh, the, the other one's integrity. If you lie, cheat, steal, compromise sure. uh, your integrity, mm -hmm. um, Stephen Covey says you can regain trust. I think in those in those particular areas, men and women, if you lie, you cheat, you steal, uh, and, and you say it was situ situational. I'd never mm -hmm. do that in this kind of a situation. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that that trust factor is is eroding rapidly. Sure. So, that that would be just a quick kind of burst back yeah. at you, Max. Absolutely. Now, you've also had experience uh, working with the Joint Staff at the Pentagon, uh, also represented the Marines on the Hill as a congressional liaison. When, when do you know your leadership style is working? What are the indicators that, 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 that the situation that you explained in, our, in your first response, when do you know that, that everything's clicking and working for your leadership style? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, uh, at least for me anyway, I don't have hard metrics where I go out and say, okay, mm -hmm. if, if I walk out and pan the crowd and 60% have smiles on their faces, I think that's important, by the way, right. but, I, but I've never put a, uh, I've never put like a percentage on it. I, I, I think, I, I can tell, as, as, of course, as the leader, I was never the smartest person in any room I ever sat in, mm -hmm. never the strongest person in the weight room or the fastest person on the track. Sure. But, I, but it always seemed like those folks who are around, if you build that organization where they can't, the strong person can't wait to live, the fast person can't wait to run, and the smart person can't wait to chime in with an idea, mm -hmm. uh, then, 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 I, then I think it's all, all coming together. You're playing everybody to their strength. And as the leader, 
uh, I believe our responsibility as leaders, Max, is to create an environment that empowers, empowers young men and women to feel not threatened to speak up at the table and to disagree. If, if you have a culture where disagreement is viewed as disrespect by the mm -hmm. leader, right. it's over. The good ideas will stay on the sidelines. And, and I've been in, be in, in meetings where the boss has said, uh, you know, come on, I want to get some ideas. We need some creative juices out of here. Mm -hmm. What we've been doing is not, not working. We're, mm -hmm. not, we're not getting the metrics, back to your point, we're not getting the metrics we desired achieving our end state. And I've seen somebody go, well, hey, boss, what about this? And I saw the individual go, that's so amateurish. I mean, you know, like, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's a rookie statement. You don't think I haven't already thought of that? If that was a good idea, I'd already mm -hmm. have it on the table. Bang, bang, bang. And then he looks around the room and goes, anybody else have a good idea? Everybody else is sitting there going, that didn't look like fun. Yeah. So I, I think if you, if you create an environment where, where people, <clears throat> my metric is folks are excited to be at work. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking at the clock saying, wow, is it that late already? Mm -hmm. Not holy hell, is that all the later it is? Yeah. And then you can sort of tell by their attitude, the skip in their step, the enthusiasm when they come to a meeting. When you ask for thoughts and ideas, they chime in. They're excited when they come in because the command climate or the business environment, if it, to, to put on the business side, is such that I am given the opportunity to get my idea on the table, mm -hmm. to discuss it. Maybe it won't be adopted, maybe a part of it will, but I have not been told to, I don't feel intimidated to the point where I just come I watch the clock. I come to work for a paycheck, not to contribute. Right. And and it's it's not it's it is tangible, but you can't measure it. You know with a, with a uh, with a caliper or anything. It's more you got to watch it. You can sort of tell, and you can tell when shoulders are drooping and and times are tough. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, okay, maybe. Maybe I got in sleep deprivation. Maybe I got tired and I haven't provided my normal spark. They've seen the change. I'm failing as a leader. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that that, uh, that particular leader's entire philosophy was bad, sure. but you, know, you have to check yourself because normally if the unit changes like that, mm -hmm. you know, take a look in the mirror. It's probably subconsciously it's right. you that have changed and, and either they think, A, they disappointed you or B, there, uh, they feel the pressure or the oppressiveness of, of your of your present attitude. Sure. Well, along those lines, General, we've also heard over time that uh, good leaders learn as much from things that don't work out as they do from things that do work out. Um, what would you say was your greatest failure, and what would you say you've learned from that? Uh, I had a I had a a very close failure in, in combat in the Battle of Fallujah with mm -hmm. a division commander. Uh, wanted to, well, I get into too much detail. There's a big railroad that ran right. across the northern sector of the town. Mm -hmm. Well, it came down level with the train station on the left flank as we were ready to attack into the battle with a regiment and three battalions, led by an army battalion and mm -hmm. two marine battalions. On the left, they would go right over the tracks. The right attack was going to go down under an underpass, and the division commander wanted to blow the railroad up. He wanted to blow the berm down level with uh, with uh, aviation so that then he could roar across in mass and uh, I I looked at the fact that the railroad was a protected target and I didn't want to blow it up because I wanted to keep commerce going up towards the Turkish border mm -hmm. so I said no we can make it under the underpass and I said we're not doing that we're going to go under the underpass well the two-star came back the second time laid everything out, argued with me again, discussed, not enough. I mean, it was pretty heated, pretty pointed, but he had facts and I had an opinion, he had an opinion, and I said no. And we're going to attack the next day when he comes back a third time, but I, I, I think my attitude, although I, I like to think I don't ever shut anybody completely down mm -hmm. by telling him that, uh, no, that's it, uh, we're not doing it, you know, this, this conversation's over, uh, he went to the sergeant major. And he and the sergeant major approached me to kind of take an indirect route on it. Uh -huh. And when he laid it all out, Max, uh, I saw the uh, error in my way. Hmm. Uh, had he not come back the third time, they had, a, they had put IEDs in the underpass, and it would have caved in on the oh lead elements of the army. Wow. And now the left flank would have busted over and gone in, and mm -hmm. they would have had their complete flank wide open to raking enemy fire from the from the right side of the attack because the right force would have been bottlenecked and, and stopped. So that night after that conversation, I just looked at Joe Latonsky and said, and the Sergeant Major Kent, I said, you're absolutely right. This is a bad decision. Thank God that you came back a third time. Wow. We called the uh, wing commander, 
got launched the aircraft, came up and dropped 2,000 pound bombs on it. Mm -hmm. and, and believe it, because then my fear was, what if they make a big gully? Sure. But they uh, weaponeered it perfectly. They blew the railroad, and the next day the attack was, uh, the attack, both flanks crossed uh, at the same speed. Right. And it still bothers me to this day. Every every Christmas, I have Christmas dinner, our families with General uh, Rich Natonsky, and I always toast him. Right. I toast him for being the man with enough character and mm -hmm. enough moxie to come back a third time. And he always makes me feel good by countering back by saying, why toast you? Because you created an environment where I felt I could come back a third time. Well, along those lines, what, what was it that you learned exactly from that to be more open to your, um, you know, to other others who come to the table when you're in a tactical situation like that? I, I think even in, a, even in a strategic situation later in the J-5, any time that I learned never make your mind completely up, which I had done. I, I had closed it out at that point. I mm -hmm. thought two tries was enough. But the truth be known, Max, any time new information becomes available, a good leader, uh, sometimes we don't want to hear the new information because right. it may change the plan and mm -hmm. we're in love with it. But the truth be known, uh, that when, when young people or senior people have a great idea or additional information that wasn't part of the original decision or maybe I didn't hear it correctly, which is what this one was, I learned a lesson to be more open-minded and, uh, and say, hey, I now say come back as many times as necessary mm -hmm. until I figure now wow. the only thing you're bringing is more emotion and you're talking louder, then sure. it's over. But if you're bringing new facts and figures that may change the calculus, then I learned to be more patient there. Uh, I, and I think it was we were all tired. We've been planning forever. Sure. Part of it was I also learned you need to be you need to have good sleep. You need to rest up <laughs> when, a, when big times are coming and big decisions have to be made. Getting up early and staying up late to read more doesn't help you as much as maybe getting an extra two hours sleep, because I, I think that I think that I was just tired of discussing it, and, mm -hmm. and that's that's a bad move on a leader's part to say no more. I'm, I'm done. I can't take right. any more. Well, very good. Who do you consider your heroes, General? I just lost one of my heroes, uh, yeah. my ultimate hero in the Marine Corps, uh, just this past week, uh, General Carl Mundy former commandant of the Marine Corps, just passed away. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. He, uh, he, had, uh, uh, and he was just a phenomenal human being. Mm -hmm. He did what was right because it was the right thing to do. He took criticism for not being, in some cases, bold and audacious and finger-pointing and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, taking people on, but he worked indirectly for the good of the Marine Corps as the commandant. Wow. He was a man of unbelievable, impeccable character, tremendous uh, uh, moral and physical courage, and I, I learned when I worked on Capitol Hill for those four years, mm -hmm. he was the commandant. So I saw him mm -hmm. interact with members of Congress behind closed doors uh, w with uh, unrelenting and, uh, you know, unapologetic for the needs of Marines and sailors sure. that, uh, to, to, to move forward. So uh, that's an easy one for me to answer. I looked at him and said, well, if I could be half of the officer that uh, General Carl Mundy is, then, uh, then I'll be an okay Marine. General Sattler, thank you very much for your service and thank you for sharing your insights and uh, perspectives on leadership with us. We appreciate your support and best of luck on your future endeavors. I'm Max Kakis. You've been watching the FCA Leadership Forum Five Questions Series.